Welcome to the Rounds to Residency podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, get clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships and residency in healthcare. We interview preceptors and physician educators who will prepare you for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Dr. Frank Okosun is an internal medicine specialist and practitioner, and he was the vice president of the House Staff Association during his internship. He also has a special interest in diabetes, hypertension, and preventive health maintenance, including occupational health. He also provides care to underserved populations. Frank, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. So I got to start off with the icebreaker question, and that is... In particular, for internal medicine, what is the biggest challenge you see facing residents in your specialty right now? So internal medicine is a very popular specialty right now, especially since you have to do internal medicine to go into specialties like gastroenterology or cardiology. So it's an extremely competitive specialty right now. And it's one of the most top specialties that students or residents apply to in the last couple of years. So it's very competitive. You have to have very good scores. You have to have possibly a research or academic background to get into internal medicine. Yeah, it's interesting because internal medicine is one of those few specialties that really branches out so much. It has so many subspecialties and fellowships that follow that it really is the gateway to a lot of other medical specialties. So in that aspect, it's very competitive and a lot of students desire that broad aspect of being able to take care of pretty much everyone, I guess, minus pediatrics, which seems to be the one limitation in IM. Yes, unfortunately. And then just a little bit more about your background, because I was curious to read, and as we discussed a little beforehand, the occupational health aspect of yours, because in previous interviews we've done with the occupational and environmental specialty, which is a completely different specialty than internal medicine, and there seems to be some interesting overlap, but possibly also some interesting differences here. So could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yes. My background of internal medicine and the city where I have my practice located, I'm surrounded by a lot of oil and gas industries. Those companies, they do physicals before they hire people on because these companies that people are going to be working at extreme heights, it's not on head of to have employees working at 200 feet above the ground. They are working at extremes of temperatures and things like that. So the companies want to make sure that employees fairly fit because of to reduce liability issues. So what they typically do is they have them go through a physical check their blood pressure, check their urine, make sure they don't have any glucose, check their vision. And if any abnormalities are found, they are then sent to me for further evaluation and treatment and for me to determine if they are physically fit to work at that site. Yeah, you're not getting to get me to work 200 feet up in the air, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> they get paid pretty well, I have to say. And they get a lot of overtime. Ugh. So these are really high pain middle-class jobs. All right. I guess I can understand the allure for some people. Just heights are not my thing. Never have been, never will be. (laughs) I am scared of heights too. I don't think I will fare very well. So they don't want them to have very high blood pressure, be diabetic, and they don't know it. And then they climb to heights and then they fall or something happens. And then it's increased liability for the company. And a lot of these people, they just wake up every day and go to their job. So they don't really go to the doctor. So we've detected a lot of diabetes and high blood pressure and even obstructive sleep apnea in people who had no idea that they had such conditions. So it's a really a good thing that the company is actually doing those physicals so that people can kind of get a better control of their health. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think when most, especially medical students that might not have gone into the clinic yet, especially, or even if they have, it's probably in the hospital setting. Most internal medicine clinical rotations through American schools anyway are done as sort of the hospitalist setting. And I understand that your practice is quite different and you're able to, it seems like, do more rural medicine and more telemedicine and just a lot of variations that are very, very different than the hospitalist internal medicine 
Could you maybe discuss what some of those differences are? Yes. So with the hospital medicine part of it, the hospitalist or the internal medicine physician or family practice physician just has a limited interaction with the patient. They are there for a very acute problem, heart attack, congestive heart failure, or polycontrol diabetes. So they just have an interaction with the patient for about two, three days, get that problem fixed, and then they hand over the patient to us we that work as an outpatient internist. So we develop long-term relationships with these patients. So we see these patients at their very lows, and then we work with them, and we see them through so many variety of issues. So I see patients for common things like high blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol, as well as for other unrelated things like anxiety, depression, ADHD, erectile dysfunction, infertility issues. We see these patients over a long span of time, typically over the lifetime of those patients, and we develop this trust with them, and they take our advice and our opinions very, very seriously. And it's just a very good team-based relationship to take care of those patients, unlike the hospital medicine relationship, where every time they go into the hospital, it might be a different doctor. Very true. I know that I had two internal medicine rotations. My first one through the school was actually similar to your clinic. It was a private practice sort of outpatient facility with the ability to go to the hospital once in a while. And then the second one that I attained on my own was a hospitalist rotation. So it was extremely different as anyone could probably imagine. But I suppose the aspect of your clinical setting really reminded me of my family medicine rotation, for instance, because you have that long-term care. You're really getting to know the patients, develop a rapport. They get to trust you. It's not in and out of a patient room every 15 minutes. So it's interesting that a lot of students might not know that you can actually have that same family care aspect that a lot of students want to develop a rapport with their patients, but in other specialties as well. Yes, definitely. And when I have students rotate with me, the patients actually just love them. So when they are gone and maybe a patient that they collect or took history from comes back, they're actually asking about the patient. Oh, they're asking about the student. Oh, how's he doing? Has he graduated? Have you heard from him? Oh, where is he? Because they just assume that they are kind of like part of the team. They don't realize they have to go on to other rotations or finish up their education. So it's a really gratifying experience and the patients definitely appreciate the relationship. Like I just saw a patient yesterday who had actually moved out of state. He's in the oil and gas industry and he had moved to Louisiana and he just recently got diagnosed with diabetes and he drove three and a half hours just to see me because he said that I am the only person he trusts. So for somebody to drive over 300 miles from another state just to see me when there are other people he can see in his new area, it just makes my day and it makes me want to be a better version of myself because I would not want to betray that trust which that person has in me. That is a great story, a great relationship that you built and really shows the positive influence that this type of rotation, this type of internal medicine clinical setting can really have on the patients. I often get the impression that people think that you know internal medicine is really meant to be in the hospital and you're supposed to become a specialist and you're supposed to do this, supposed to do that, but there are a lot of other options. And another one that you also do is telemedicine, which from my personal experiences were mostly or seem to in the past year have been more in the primary care family medicine type of specialties. But since you're also in a very similar primary care setting here, you've been able to utilize that too with your patients and with your students. Yeah, definitely. So obviously, we know when the pandemic hit, we had to go think out of the box. And the traditional approach of having the patients come to the office and all that definitely was gone. But people's diabetes and high blood pressure doesn't go away. So the care must continue. So that's how we had to improvise and come up with the telemedicine option. And it's been a very interesting experience. Patients have really liked it. We obviously have one or two older patients who might not be tech savvy that 
had a little bit of issues getting on board with it. But for especially established patients who were monitoring them for diabetes or high blood pressure or congestive heart failure, it definitely comes in handy. They can have the visit in the comfort of their home and not worry about transportation to the doctor's office or getting potentially exposed to somebody in the doctor's office. But obviously, there are certain conditions or certain new patients that you cannot really replace the traditional visit with where you have to see them and touch a mass or touch a swelling or take a look at something. But I will say for the most part, it has definitely been a lifesaver. And I hope that the insurances continue to keep the reimbursements the same even after the pandemic is over. Let's hope. (laughs) Unlikely (laughs) knowing them, but (laughs) we'll hope. (laughs) Yes. This episode is brought to you by findarotation.com, where students and preceptors can schedule rotations with ease and security and schedule your next clinical rotation. That's Find a Rotation, your medical and healthcare clinical rotations platform. All right, so now we have a much better idea of really what these different kinds of internal medicine settings might be outside of what would be considered traditional or at least what students think of as what the internal medicine setting is usually. So I do want to kind of transition a little into some of the tips for students if they're going to start a clinical rotation with you or maybe thinking about applying for a residency in internal medicine. Are there a couple of things that you would say, oh, we'll start with a clerkship uh, rotation with you that they should do ahead of time or anything that they should definitely not do? What are the pros and cons, the do's and don'ts? I think, first of all, they have to take it very seriously, especially if you want to make a great impression and potentially maybe ask for a letter of recommendation from the doctor that they're going to be precepting. They definitely want to take it seriously. So I expect them to arrive on time, do their homework way before time, get their logistics in order, where they're going to stay, know the location of the clinic know the hours of the clinic, dress appropriately or ask about appropriate attire, come ready to learn and not just be disinterested or playing on their phones, ask intelligent questions, read up on interesting topics, show initiative, be interested in getting involved in the management of the patient, ask to talk to patients, ask to see procedures done or get involved in procedures. And just come with a lot of energy. Like I said, internal medicine is only going to get more competitive. So people have to show that zeal and interest to be able to enjoy and enter internal medicine. And we always say that you want to also make sure to ask for a strong letter of recommendation, because if you just ask for one, sometimes the preceptor feels obligated to write one, but they might not make you the best one. So if you specify, I want a strong letter of recommendation, then they're going to say, yeah, I don't feel comfortable with that. Or, okay, yeah, you deserve it. (laughs) You really know that you're getting what you're looking for at that point. (laughs) Yeah. So whether you specify for a strong one or not, it's going to go with your work ethic. You can specify all you want all day. If you were not there half of the time, the time you were there, you were late, you didn't ask questions, you weren't engaged. The doctor is going to write you his version of strong. And you have have to either go with it or do what you have to do. So it's about bringing the work ethic and all that. And very strong students who I have worked with, I sometimes don't even wait for them to ask me. I go ahead and offer them and say, hey, if you ever need a letter, just let me know. And for students who don't seem interested, I mean, I don't bring it up. And if they were to bring it up, like I said, I would just write a very generic letter. Yep, is probably something that happens to a lot of students and they don't know. Yeah, because that's my (laughs) reputation on the line. I mean, if I want to recommend somebody, I want to make sure that I can vouch for the person and I know what they can do. I've spent a lot of time and energy to build up my reputation and I will hate for somebody to ruin that. Exactly. And as we kind of go into the more residency type questions, you have said that it's just going to continue to get more competitive, more students, a higher percentage of students are applying to internal medicine maybe than before. And the residency spots aren't necessarily increasing to match the need. 
So that is correct. What are first off, especially since we both have a little more knowledge on this aspect, how big of a part do you think that the internal medicine students and graduates, such as myself, play a part in this increase and the sort of the future of how residency competitiveness is going to be? So the thing about it is, obviously, we know that over the last couple of years, there's been increased amount of student debt. So when students come out of medical school, they are not looking towards the less pain specialties like pediatrics or primary care. People are looking towards the higher pain specialty because they have all these student loans to pay back. So that's why if you look at applications to specialties like orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery, dermatology is very high, as well as internal medicine specialties such as cardiology, gastroenterology, pulmonology. So the student debt and the salaries of these positions are driving a lot of those applications in those directions. So people are going to be more inclined to apply to urology, anesthesiology, plastic surgery because of the high income potential, as well as the less work stress compared with all these other specialties. And like I said, you can only go into cardiology or gastroenterology by going through internal medicine. And those applications are only just going to increase. And like you've already highlighted, we are having more medical schools, but we're not having more residency positions. I'll give you an example. The city of Houston, in the last two years, we got two new medical schools. And we're not talking about Texas or the whole US. We're just talking about Houston. We've gotten two new medical schools. So those are going to be more medical graduates coming out and they're going to be vying for the same residency positions. And unfortunately, Medicare and the federal government, they put a cap on residency positions since the 90s. There have not been any significant increases in residency positions. So it's more students and less residency positions. So the competitiveness is just only going to get steeper and steeper. Completely agree. Yeah, and there just aren't going to be enough clinical sites for a lot of these students either, which is something that we're trying to fix, open up more sites and more locations to more students. But Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and what sort of qualities do you think really would drive someone to be a good fit for internal medicine versus family medicine or psychiatry or some other specialty? Are there any certain factors that really make someone a good match for this specialty? Yes. So I think in internal medicine, I mean, I'm not trying to reduce or belittle any other specialty, but in internal medicine, you have to be ready to be very hard working. So you have to be ready to pull in a 16 or 18 hour shift if needed on short notice. You have to be able to think on your feet. So you have to be able to multitask, think on your feet. If a patient is in an emergency, I mean, a patient doesn't give you a phone call and say, oh, I'm going to have a cardiac arrest today. Yeah, things just happen and you have to be calm. You can't be flustered or even though you don't know all the answers, you have to have that calmness about you because you are the leader of the team. If there's a cold situation going, the the physician is the leader of the team. Or if there's anything going on, the physician is the leader of the team. So if you are panicky and you are flustered, people around you will begin to lose confidence in you and everything will just go downhill from there. So nobody expects you to have all the answers and know everything, but you have to know how to be calm under pressure, be able to multitask, not to raise your voice, not to get angry, not to snap. And you have to also be very empathetic. You can't just treat these patients like they're just numbers. You have to see where they're coming from. If it's necessary, and you need to touch them. If you need to make eye contact, if you need to spend an extra minute, you can give them the impression that they are in a hurry. When I'm in a patient's room, I try to make the patient feel like they are the only patient I have to see that day. Even though I know there are people knocking on the door and saying, oh, you're a little bit behind. I make sure that I give that patient that attention for that minute because that will just help the patient relationship. They will trust you more. They will do what you say more or what you instruct them to do. 
they are more than likely to come back. They are more than likely to be more compliant with medications or therapy that you prescribe. But if you give them that impression that you're in a rush, you're in a hurry, you are not really listening to their complaints or what they are telling you, it just harms the whole process. And then they are more likely to be no-shows for the appointments, not to pick up their medicines, not to follow up with specialists like you recommended and things like that. I love it. I think I'm going to use that for a quote of this episode. Make them feel like they're the only ones that are there. <laughs> yes, yes, the yes, day. yes. Yeah, so you have to treat them like family. You got to just, don't just make them feel like they're just another number. Yeah, we hear that happens way too often. All right, so we have covered a lot of material here from the unique setting of internal medicine as your clinical setting is and experiences there and the ability to really branch out into other types of patient populations that you wouldn't necessarily see as a hospitalist. We've covered some tips for clinical rotations and rounds and aspects of residency and the potential increases in competitiveness for internal medicine. We've covered all of the fellowships and specialties. Everything seems to fall into internal medicine. So really just have one more question for you. And that is, do you have any last pearls of wisdom you'd like to share with the audience? I will say not to give up on your dreams. Everybody has a different race in life. Sometimes as humans, we're quick to look at people who we consider our contemporaries and we tend to see how well they are doing and how bad we are doing. Everybody's on a different race. If you try to get out of your race and go into somebody else's race, whatever you see, you have to take it. So everybody's on a different time scale. It doesn't mean because XYZ got residency last year, you were supposed to get residency last year. Everybody's on a different time scale and on a different path in life. So as long as you are not standing in one spot and you are constantly chugging and doing something, you just need to be patient and just keep doing what you're doing. But if you get all depressed and all sad and all devastated, then it's just going to go downhill from there. Well said. Feel that constantly. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any ways that you would like the audience to reach out to you if they have any questions? Definitely. So I have a website, www.frankokosunmd.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. That's actually how we met. So I already have students or people who reach out to me for mentorship opportunities. So I try to be positive and encourage people to try to live out to their fullest potential because I've been on the other side. I know it's not easy and it's a privilege, which I definitely appreciate. I don't think I'm the most intelligent person out there. So I do not take my position for granted. And it's my goal to help as many people as I possibly can, because I understand it can get very frustrating and depressing, but you just got to keep going. Great advice. Well, Dr. Frank Okoson, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I appreciate it anytime. You have a great weekend. The Rounds to Residency podcast is powered by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, like USMLE tutoring or residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time. <laughs>